Well, here we are, folks. It's time for another week of the Rec Poker Podcast. I'm your host, Jim Reed, Bluff Storini in the home games. And if you want to find out about me and the rest of the Wrecking Crew, you can go to rec.poker slash crew. Um, if you don't know what Rec Poker is all about, A, it's kind of weird that you're tuning in, but thanks for joining us. Uh, B, we're a free learning community where uh, amateur recreational poker players like us who want to have fun, win all the chips, beat everybody, but do it in a really respectful and positive manner, get together to have fun, uh, learn how to get better and share our love of poker with the world. So I got to thank our sponsors, Website Amp and Running Aces Hotel, Racetrack and Casino. And I also have to thank everyone who uh, helps us out here on the Wrecking Crew, uh, which you can find out more about by going to rec.poker slash crew. But you can also just listen up because you're about to hear from a bunch of them right here. Well, I'm Chris Jones. You can find me 5b5 on Twitter or 5 by 5 on PokerStars. I'm John Somsky and I'm Poker Geeky Man everywhere. I'm Keith Brandt and I'm Monkey System everywhere. I'm Kim Kilroy. I'm Fergie 56 on the home game and pet that pet that 33 everywhere else. I'm Rob Washam and I'm Rabman 50, just about any place you can find me. And I'm so happy that we're also joined by a few premium members tonight. John, Stu, and Joseph are here to talk about um, some hands that we're going to pull from the Rec Poker forums. So it's Monday night. We're talking poker. We're pulling some hands from the Rec Poker forums. They're free to join. Uh, come to Rec.Poker right now and sign up for a free account and get involved with us. Uh, we're looking at actually a collection of hands from our very own 5 by 5 Chris Jones. And what they have in common, is they're part of his recent blind versus blind study. So Chris, why don't you talk a little bit about what caused you to start looking at blind versus blind, and um, then we can get into the hands here. Uh, well, I mean, and, and I should even be more sp- like blind versus blind, uh, basically where they're limped by the small blind is like really what I've been looking at. Um, and, um, the reason is cause I think it, it happens more often than, you know, this is a pretty frequent situation we're in where we're either in the small blind, we limp ourselves or we're in the big blind, the small blind has limped to us. Um, and then we get to a, a, a flop post flop after, you know, some stuff happens. And then what do we do? And, um, I think one of the things that, that I'm, um, am my operating theory, and I will be, uh, willing to be proven wrong or talked down from the ledge is that, um, players, uh, player pools and player fields over bluff in these spots because they think that basically it is that no one can have anything. And so like, they feel like if they just keep carrying away betting. And so the, the counter strategy to that is that uh, we sometimes have to hang on. Um, And both of these hands have me hanging on. um, And I'm curious what, what we think of it. So should I go through the the two hands or what, how, how do you want to approach this? Yeah. I just want to say like, I have noticed even in our own conversations over the last year or two, people are talking about limping in the small blind a lot more as part of a balanced strategic play. Um, I've also seen a lot of people talking about limping in late position when stacks start to get shorter. And I've always felt like limping, if you can limp in a balanced fashion, it's got to be a way to exploit people that are going to make bad assumptions about it. It's just hard to do it in a balanced fashion um that without giving up some kind of ev so i think you're bang on the money this is something that is good to be ahead of because i think we're going to end up seeing two kinds of limpers going forward the people that are just passively limping bad hands poorly which we should be taking advantage of but we don't want to confuse them for these kind of savvy technical technical players who are going to be just limping for good sound reasons with the right hand so i'm very curious to see how this whole thing uh, comes out john did you have something there well, yeah, I was going to say, I mean, once you get down to blind versus blind, it, it's very similar to, you know, a heads up tournament or heads up play. I mean, it is heads up play at that point in time, but the weight ranges are going to be incredibly wide. Um, and because of that, you, the odds of people actually hitting their hand, well, and odds of any any random hand hitting the flop is about 33%. So two thirds of the time, your opponent's not going to make a hand. Um, And in heads up pot, blind versus blind, particularly if it was raised pre, uh, I think there's way more than a third of the time. Is there a bet 
being thrown out there. Mm-hmm. Um, so I do think, and if you do hit any part of it, you do pretty much have to just hold on and pray. Um, if you are not willing to do that, or if you don't think you can evaluate whether or not your opponent has something, because a lot of times the turn in the river don't change much of anything. So you just have to kind of go with your read and evaluate whether or not you think you have them. And if they're the type of person player that just continually bets, you just have to hold on and pray you win in the end. If you have a hand, obviously you don't keep calling down with nothing. All right, Chris. Hi. <laughs> oh, there you go, Rob. Sorry. <laughs> you might call down with ace high. Yeah. Well, should I, should I should I kind of go through? Okay, so I'll go through the first hand. Um, so in this one, uh, we are in the small blind. These, there's two hands. One I'm in the small blind. One I'm in the big blind that we kind of want to talk through. First hand, I'm in the small blind. Folds to me. Uh, I have king six of hearts and 28 big blinds. We are. Oh, by the way, this is um, these two hands were really instrumental. We are deep in a tournament. We're already in the money. Um, there's, uh, this is a big tournament. There's $60,000 for the winner. Um, and we are, I think with, there's less than, I would say 90 left from a starting field of about 3000. So these are, these are big spots, right? So this, this, there's lots of money on the line. Um, you know, we've, we've made some money here, but there's, we're, we're, we're trying to, trying to go deeper. So anyway, it folds to us, king, six of hearts. We have 28 big blinds. We uh, limp ourselves. And the player in the uh, the big blind who has been very aggressive, um, they are um, a frequent uh, better. They've got um, stats that show them to be one of the more aggressive players at the table. And I have a decent number of hands on this player. So um, I feel pretty good in that read. Uh, they raise. Um, and uh, I elect to flat here. Um, now, this could be one where we might even uh, raise again, given our king blocker, the suited factor, and the fact that we've got an aggressive player. But um, I liked potentially uh, seeing a flop in this high leverage spot and then kind of evaluating. So anyway, we, we flat ourselves and the flop comes six of clubs, eight of clubs, eight of spades. So we hit bottom pair on a paired board um, and it's up to us. Um, I'll keep going, I guess. I, so I check uh, and our opponent bets small um, and we elect to call. I don't think that's very controversial. We've got bottom pair. Um, and uh, the turn is the three of hearts. Uh, so uh, six of clubs, eight of clubs, eight of spades, three of hearts. Uh, again, we have king six of hearts. Um, we check again. Um, and now our opponent bets a little bit uh, over half pot, about uh, seven big blinds into a pot of 11 and a half. Um, we have 24 behind, so it's starting to get dicey. Um, but I, you know, my feeling is like, okay, this opponent could be doing this with some clubs. They could be doing this with, you know, some marginal hands. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm not too nervous about an eight given that raise, there aren't a ton of eights in our opponent's range in my read. You know, there's maybe ace eight, king eight suited, pocket eights, but there's not a ton else out there. Maybe a queen eight suited, you know, some of those kinds of hands, maybe seven eight suited, but there aren't a lot of eights here. So I'm not feeling too bad about my six. So I elect to call. Uh, and the turn brings the third club, which is the 10 of clubs. So now our final board is six of clubs, eight of clubs, eight of spades, three of hearts, 10 of clubs. We check, hoping our opponent will check behind. They jam. And um, this is one of those spots where, you know, do we do we fold, keep our 16 big blinds and move on with our lives? Or do we um, really think about this hand and, and make a decision for our tournament life here? 
So it, it does have that, it, fa- it passes that first test that you were talking about where like it's a scary board where like really big hands are possible, right? Where it's paired and uh, it, it's it's got that dynamic quality to it through the streets. So it feels like the kind of board that that this player that you're describing can decide like, oh, I can scare someone here. Um, but I'm not sure, I'm not sure that story is consistent throughout the entire hand. Um, which is also something that we see from less experienced players, I think, that they find a bluff spot and they're like, oh, this is a good spot to bluff, but it's not part of the story that they've been that they've been telling. I'm not sure if, if that is the case here. Rob? The fact that there's two eights out there tells me that he doesn't have an eight. Right. You know, to, to Chris's point, um, how many eights are there that he's raising pre-flop with? You know, king eight, probably, um, ace eight, maybe, maybe even queen eight. You know, that could be a hand that's out there, but there's so many other hands that don't have an eight in them and don't have a pair at all to begin with. So when you're sitting there with eight, eight, six, and you have king six, I'm feeling like I almost got the nuts here. I'm feeling really, really confident that this player, I have this player beat right now because unless he happens to have an over pair, there's no other hand out there other than maybe a six you know coincidentally he has a six other than that i'm i've got the freaking nuts so yeah i'm calling right here and then you get the three of hearts on the turn doesn't change anything i mean you're still you're still way ahead so the only question comes on the on the river uh the ten of clubs hits but i don't know if there's a timing tell here was he very quick in his i mean just snap bet or did he wait a while? I mean, that might indicate something, but I would think that there's no way I could fold this no matter what he did. There's just not enough information and there, nothing has changed. I had the nuts on the flop. I have the nuts on the turn. It'd have to be really just that perfect hand for me not to be winning right now. Yeah, I think he probably, the most likely hands that beat us here are clubs. Like he can, he there are a lot of cl- club drum books club combos that will do this right that will triple barrel here they had two clubs on the flop they didn't get there on the turn they barrel again then they get there on the river um and that can be also a kind of hand that that raises pre-flop so we do lose to some of those but there aren't that many combos of clubs here so i think there's more combos of bluffs than there are of clubs and i think like you said i'm i'm ruling out a lot of eights so i'm mostly nervous about the club combos at this point. And are there any, uh, when we talk about the hands that they might be bluffing with, is there, do you have like natural combos in mind for that? Or it's just a sense that inexperienced single, players are going to bluff Single clubs. More? Yeah, just single like, club hands. Like, like single, cl- single high clubs feel like a really natural bluff. And, and when I call, I did call, by the way. So when I call here, I am f- uh, fairly uh, much expecting to see um, a single club in their hand. Um, so John John has a question, and I know Kim wants to jump in here with some advanced uh, poker training. Yeah. Uh, John John asks, why aren't you nervous about overpairs? I guess I am. I am nervous about si- uh, overpair. Well, and I, I do think so. This player is very aggressive, but they're also very good. Uh, they have good results. There, um, so I don't think that this is just. Although we will see see the results, and it <laughs> might change your mind. But um, I don't think um, I, I'm at the time, at least. I was thinking they're not going to just blast off here. I think um, like pocket queens, pocket jacks here. I think is probably checking this river. Like I'm not scared. Like the thing that I if if they had like pocket kings with the king of clubs, pocket aces with the ace of clubs. Maybe they're doing it because they think they block clubs there, but I, even then, I'm not sure. I just don't think those over pairs are are taking that thin of a line on the the river. But they, you know, they might. Some players might. Do they ever have seven nine here? Like it's a good player. They're gonna when you limp, they could be raising every hand, especially seven nine suited, something like that. Yeah, they seven nine suited. Straights. Yeah, it could be in there for sure, for sure. Okay. 
Yeah, I think clubs, maybe seven, nine, maybe, and like maybe like pocket eights or like ace eight or something like that is in there. Um, so that we, we definitely lose to some some hands, but I think there's a lot of bluffs too. There's a ton of bluffs, especially in a limped. Uh, well, it wasn't limped totally, but I limped and then they raised. But I mean, it just mm-hmm. they just have a lot. Okay, I just want to quick. You just said this is a very good player. Uh, right. They have good results. I, you know, I, I right. I'll, I'll so just as stand far as you know, they're <laughs> yeah. okay. They're you think they're a good player. So I did re- run this in the solver, and the solver likes the limp jam hmm. with this particular hand seventy percent of the time. On um, preflop, and, and I would say preflop because, and I would say what would sway me to go a hundred percent is if I'm against a good player and they're going to have a position on me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's something to consider with a hand as good as because you when when you limp uh, a suited king heads up that like that's in the top range of hands, right. right? Right. So if I was not against a really good player, then I really like the call. Right, we're disguising the strength of our hand and all of that. Um, but it, when we're against a good player and we're going to be out of position, I kind of like the jam that the solver says is a good idea in this spot. Yeah. How do you, that's actually a really good. So how do you balance the, you know, quote unquote, good player with the quote unquote aggressive player? Like to me, there's also the, the counterpoint to that is that I often find myself like calling against really aggressive players because I want them. I want to give them room to blast off. Basically. I want to give them the space to do that versus you know, just, just kind of run my equity right now. And, and, you know, if I get called, you know, hopefully it's, it's going to be, you know, somewhat of a, a fight with the King six, but um, how, how do you, how do you balance those two things when you're up, you know, you're out of position against a good player, but you're also out of position against an aggressive player. And maybe if you hit your hand, you can get a lot of chips. Well, an aggressive good player is the worst to be right. against out of position. Right. Yeah. Get a new table. <laughs> so, Right. So I would just shark scope them if that was online, right? To know if they are a winning player and a good player. And if it wasn't online and we were playing live, I would just have watched this player and see if they are capable of making good plays and good moves or whether they think they're just in a splashy, aggressive player. So that's where well, I would we, make the decision. We do call. Um, and anyone want to guess what they had? <laughs> Shocked me. They only had one card. It was the weirdest thing. Yeah. They had uh four deuce of diamonds. Wow, well, yeah. So I was wow. very much expecting if they, mm-hmm. to them to have a club blocker there um when when they make this bluff. Uh so I that uh, I was not expecting to see four deuce, but we won, so that was good. So Chris, do you think that's the old there's only one way I can win a pot with four high play and just, yeah. Yeah. I mean, they had the, they had the, the, you know, gut shot after the turn, uh, which they then bet and then they didn't get there. And I guess it's the, the representing the draw that didn't, that you don't, that you don't have is sort of mm-hmm. the, the play here. Mm-hmm. And, um, it's, and it started pre-flop with the raise. He just expected you to fold after limping. Right. 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 And you know you are going to fold. Here. You are going to fold a better hand than him um, a lot when he makes that play. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if he's if Most he's bluffing this this hand, he's bluffing. He's got so many bluffs in his range. Yeah. So, and that was my read. This was a pretty, this was a uh, pretty read heavy against a very very active aggressive player. I don't think I make this call against everybody. So. You are going to lose though a fair amount of the time. Oh sure, yeah 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 right. Yep. And yeah. the thing is, he, he can put the pressure of the entire tournament on you because yep. he's got you so well covered, right? Yep. Yep. Um, so he's putting all the pressure on you, and he figures that eventually you're just going to buckle. Yep. Um, all right. Okay. So quickly, hand two. Yeah. Okay. So hand two. Now we're in the big blind. Uh, we have. 33 big blinds, but the, our opponent has 17. So we're 17 big blinds effective. Uh, they lim- or have 18 to start. They limp. We uh, check it back with Jack six of hearts. 
And the flop comes nine of clubs, ace of hearts, jack of clubs. Uh, which also speaking to Rob's point, uh, I eliminate a ton of aces from their range uh, when they limp here. So it's also starting to feel like I've got the nuts again. Um, uh, but our opponent bets one big blind on the turn and we call and then the three of hearts comes. So now we have a flush draw to go along with our Jack um, and our opponent bets uh, three and a half big blinds. They have 12 behind uh, we call and the two of spades is on the river and they elect to jam. So they jam 12 big blinds onto a final board of nine of clubs, ace of hearts, Jack of clubs, three of hearts, Two of spades. We have jack six of hearts. What are you doing? I, mean, I think this is much simpler here, Chris. This one. This is like, I think, super easy call here. Just, I mean, I we would expect them to raise if they had an ace pre-flop. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think I ran this one through the solver as well. And I think it was played perfectly to the T. Uh, you just I, I I'm not sure they played it perfectly. But <laughs> you played it perfectly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that that we do sometimes lose to better jacks. Um, um, that that those can be sort of part of this range. Um, but that's really all I'm. Well, all I'm I think about. you know, better jacks are a lot of times are raising. Uh, maybe jack seven, jack eight um are not raising but any other jacks jack nine up is probably raising pre-flop not just limping yeah at least i would be i'm I'm not sure if that's right or not but i would think that i would be raising those especially in a blind versus blind situation like you said when we started this is you don't expect anybody to have anything yeah. so you get to this like when you limped with that king six you lived with the intention of calling a raise I would take that king six normally in the small blind and just raise it pre-flop to start with because I got a king. And that's that's a pretty powerful hand when every that other person has just any possible two cards. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's people just don't have anything in the blinds. And that's what you mentally, that's what you're thinking. Nobody has anything. Right. So if you catch any kind of that fl- any part of that flop, you've got the nuts. And that's that's honestly why I like. I, I mean, I do raise from the small blind sometimes, but I really like having a robust limping strategy from the small blind. Uh, it includes some of my very best hands, but it also includes some of these sort of like these sort of suited hands that kind of like that can withstand. Like if it's got a if it's got a face card in it and it's suited, those are, are some that I'll incorporate into my limping range because I'm comfortable calling a raise. Uh, with those and seeing three cards, it can, it's a hand that can flop pretty well. Um, I don't, I don't mind doing that, and I think you can get yourself uh, into these spots where people are are over bluffing a lot. Um, where was this in this tournament? Like they don't have much to start with. So where were we in this tournament? Uh, is really, this the same tournament? Same tournament. Now we're even deeper. So now this, I think we're down to like okay. uh, maybe. So they're just going to open and shove a lot of their their holdings because they're going to be out of position for the hand. They have less than like that. What do they have? Like seventeen big blinds. Or seventeen to start. Yep. Yeah. 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 We're down. To, I think we're forty players left, maybe with this one. So this is a this is a very, you know, we're 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 getting down to it. Um. Anyway, uh, so I do call, uh, and again, we see just a, a massive bluff here. It was 8-5 of diamonds mm. on this board, so they had very little connected or blocking or equity or anything. <laughs> so my 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 take on that is if you're going to be this deep in a tournament and you're willing to go to the fences with 8-5 of suited, then just shove it pre-flop. Because it's going to put you in a tough position with your jack high suited. Yeah. When they have seventeen big blinds, you're out of position for the hand, and just like fold, fold or shove if you want to limp, 
and you don't hit anything, just get out of the hand, in my opinion. But I mean, this is very ambitious bluff on their part. Yeah. But I do think that this, this is, I see this, I think this is something to recognize that right now in spots, I just think that the player pool in these limped blind versus blind spots, I think you'll see a lot more bluffing than you'll see in other situations. And, and, and it's just kind something of, to, to think about how you might approach that in terms of your own play. And that's kind of what brought you into this in the first place, Chris. I think you're saying that this is a spot where the player pool is over bluffing. They're, they're yeah. too ambitious generally. So we can kind of anticipate seeing some of these spots where people are bluffing without the right blockers or without the right, you know, um, not the right bluffs is usually what that means. So if they're bluffing too much, I mean, that is a good uh, take here. I got a, a question from Joseph. If there is there any benefit to raise the turn if you have the nuts, uh, given the small bets, since the board is double suited? Uh, Chris, do you want to respond to that one? Uh, because because you feel so effectively strong with your hand. Yeah, so. I mean, we could. We could. We definitely could. I tend to like... Um, when I have position, um, and I've got a pretty strong holding, yeah, maybe we're going to get drawn out on with a, with a suit there, but I tend to like to give my opponents some rope, especially ones that, that may, may be in these spots where they're bluffing too much. Um, so I, when I have position, I tend to call when I'm out of position, I would tend to shove there is, is probably my follow up to that then chris then is your river call kind of card dependent then a little bit so if if they if do if certain rivers do come in that they're going to be kind of like bluffing at a higher frequency that 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 gives them the best hand do you do you have spots where you fold uh in this spot or is it i would i mean like the king six hand i would fold more frequently than the jack six hand the jack six hand i would be hard for me I suppose if uh, I don't know what is the death what is the death card on that board? Um, I I don't know what it would be that would get me to fold. But so it's more about it's it's less about you and your range. It's more about we're doing the action that gets them to put the chips in with more of their range. So mm-hmm. if if we raise, they're going to continue with all the strong hands. Right. But our only way to get them to put chips in with the rest of their range is by calling and letting them put them in on the future street, no matter what comes, no matter what we think their hands are, essentially, yeah. it's going to be worth it uh, in the long run. Right. When I raise there, I, th- I, you know, like the thing is, is like, they're so low. Like when I raise there, are they really going to ditch a flush draw? That's really strong. Am I, am I even accomplishing what I'm hoping to accomplish by raising there? I don't know. Maybe they will, but. Yeah, the yeah. SPRs are so small. I don't know that they're going to fall. I think the death card is a nine. If you see a nine, I would be start to get very, very nervous because he could have a lot of nines yeah, that he's doing right. this with. Yeah, you're probably right. Yeah, yeah. Right. I, yeah. I, I mean, I, I, this is just a bizarre line to take this deep in a tournament. Like to me, it doesn't make any sense. This line at all. Yeah. In this in this big a tournament, this yeah. deep, yeah, no, but I think that that is exactly what I'm 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 almost like hoping to sort of like talk through a little bit is I think people are not only over bluffing these spots mm-hmm. that they're playing them pretty poorly, like mm-hmm. that that people blind versus blind. I think people sort of like it's there's just people don't study it very much. They're not used to it very much. People don't play heads up very much and they get into these spots. And I think that they just sort of like think, okay, you have an infinite range. Cause this was a limped pot. I can just blast off because you're going to have to fold. And that I think is the line that's like the line that I think a lot of players start taking. And I think we can take advantage of it if we're willing to. Rob, did you have something there? Just something, just uh, another thought about uh, limping versus raising pre-flop on these in these situations from the small blind. Um, I think it really depends on that player in the big blind. If you have a very aggressive player that's known to be three betting a lot or raising a lot to try to take you off of your hand, that's those types of players that I like to limp with those better hands. 
Because you know that they're going to try to blast you off of that with marginal holdings. Now, if you have a tighter player in the big blind, now I'm going to take that king six and I'm going to raise that preflop and just take the blinds and go. Just take the blinds and be be very happy. Yeah, (laughs) makes a lot of sense. Yep. Well, we got some good comments in here also from uh, Jamel Cuevas, uh, who talks about his own experience with these um, these overbetting situations, overbluffing situations, and from Elizabeth Bennett Martin, um, who uh, says that you know she's surprised about how the villain played a couple of these hands, um, but that it's a spot we all should be studying more because uh, she she agrees people are making big mistakes in these blind versus blind spots. Um, all right. Well, is there anything else we'd like to cover? Is there anything else generally about these blind versus blind areas that we want to sum up to folks? I mean, one big difference uh, some of our listeners should be considering is that when you're three-handed or more, the small blind is always going to be out of position post-flop. So limping the small blind kind of has this implied position um, disadvantage. When you're heads up, uh, the small blind is going to be in position post-flop. So when we talk about limping the small blind, it's always really important to know if you're talking about heads up or full ring or, or shorthanded, because uh, being in position, you're obviously going to limp the button a lot more heads up where you get to, well, I won't necessarily say that, but the dynamics going to be very different heads up when you get to play the rest of the hand uh, in position. Um, I don't see any other folks uh, itching to pipe up. So I think I'm going to thank our sponsors, the Running Aces Hotel, Racetrack and Casino and website AMP. Um, I want to thank Rob, Keith, John, John, Kim, Stu, Joseph, and Chris, uh, Steve Fredlin for making this all happen, and you, the listeners. Talk to you again soon.